and uh, have a little counseling by the healer, Dr. Amos Wilson. Thank you. Thank you kindly for your, your warm welcome. And I want to say indeed it's a pleasure to be here again. I always enjoy being here with you and sharing uh, the platform and the time and everything else with you. Uh, it's indeed uh, an honor to be invited by you again to speak on some matters that are, are very great importance to, to the whole community. I also want, of course, thank you for the support you've given in terms of the work uh, that we are doing, and I mentioned we because it's not my effort alone, but the work of a very good friend and partner of mine, myself, along with some, some other uh, dedicated persons at the African World Info Systems. Brother Tyler mentioned some of the books, of course, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children. Very, very uh, important in the sense that if we are to appropriately educate our children and appropriately socialize our children, we have to understand that's their psychology. Probably the worst approach to trying to educate our children and to socialize our children is to say that they're just like all other children, the only difference is the color of their skin. And we hear a lot of that going on. And while it's, it sounds morally pleasing and uh, it makes us feel at one with uh, the universe and all of that, uh, it doesn't, quit, it doesn't uh, fit the reality. And while people really mean well, when they make those kinds of statements. Uh, it does not fit the reality of things. The reality of things is that uh, our children differ more than uh, merely skin color. As I've often said, the black child is not a white child who happens to be black. I've mentioned to you before, of course, that the psychology of people flows from the history and experience of that people, just as the psychology of the individual flows from his or her unique history and experience. So if you're to understand the psychology of ourselves as a people and to understand our children, then we must understand the history and experience that has generated uh, that psychology. And since psychology to a significant degree is generated by history and experience, why then do we expect our psychology to be the same as that of the psychology of other people who have a very different history and experience? No more than we would expect the psychology of another individual to be the same as our own psychology as an individual, since we know that we as an individual have different history and experience from the other individual, you see. So it becomes very important that we get to know ourselves as people, which means getting to know our history and our culture, and so that we can come to know our children and approach them based on their psychology and their history and on our psychology and our history. And uh, like children, are intellectually born with a head start. And if we took advantage of their natural head start, we would not have to have artificial head start programs, <laughs> you see. But because we are unaware of the natural head start that our children have, we overlook it, we don't uh, stimulate that, the head start, we don't match it with experience, then we have to compensate for it later on. And we are behind the eight ball then. We're trying to catch up. But if we know the psychology to begin with, then we, would, we, we could accelerate and maintain the God-given intelligence of our children. Black on black violence, of course, which is what I'm going to talk a bit about today, 
it's also connected to that psychology as well, and also connected to our having to learn about ourselves and learn our psychology and learn the psychology of those we interact with. We also, of course, need to use that psychology in trying to prevent uh, criminality and reduce criminality within our community as a people. So we are, we are really in the midst of writing a series of connected books. A book that will probably be out in about six weeks, eight weeks, uh, is titled The Falsification and Mislabeling of Black Consciousness and Behavior. Uh, we are talking again about why study history. So a lot of people think history is just a study of dates. You say, and, and uh, reading information of things that happened in the past. That uh, is certainly not the case. History in the human mind is always present. The past is always present. Things that happened to you at one year old, two year old, at when you were three years old, are operating in you right at this moment. And the way you react to other people, the kind of taste you have, the desires you have, the kind of love relations you seek, and all of those kind of things are to a great extent determined by your experience before you were three or four years old. In other words, that experience, those experiences between birth and actually even in the womb itself, but between birth, two and three and four years old, operate right now to color your perception of other people, of yourself, to determine to a good degree the nature of your interaction with other people. In other words, then, the past is not something that's dead and gone and dropped off in your mind. It operates right here at this very moment, this very second, and it will operate until the day you die. And it's the same thing occurs in the history of a race. If you look at the history of a race, the way you look at an individual, those experiences that happened to us two and three hundred years ago are not dead and gone by a long shot. The ways we relate to other people, many of our political goals today, many of our social goals right now, many of the things that we desire to achieve as a people come from our experience during slavery. Many of us are sitting here right now wanting to assimilate with white folk, <laughs> wanting to be one. Many of us are struggling with the uh, feelings of inferiority and all of those kinds of things. Where did you think that started? You thought, think it started here today? It started as soon as we hit the shores of this country. And so the experience of, of ourselves as a group is alive in us. Where else can history be alive but in the minds of people? If people were not in, in existence, what would be the point? We wouldn't even have to be discussing history. Another indication of the importance of history, of course, is the fact that those who rule over us and those who dominate us have worked very hard at distorting our history and at hiding our history from us and at falsifying our history. So if history were not that important to everyday life, to real life and to concrete activities, why then has this nation and the people who rule it work so hard to destroy African history? Why are they resisting the inclusion of African history and African culture in the educational structure if they, they uh, think that uh, that inclusion is purely harmless from their point of view, you see? In other words, then, we need to gain a new appreciation of history and need to recognize that history is always present. And that to a good extent, if we are to change our present behavior and if we are to change the future, 
then we must change the past and change our relationship to it. And, we, and therefore, the falsification of, uh, and, and the mislabeling of black consciousness deals with uh, why we should study history. It deals with history as mythology. And uh, you can recognize in your everyday behavior, if you've been given the wrong history about a person, how that can change your behavior toward that person. Or if people have a wrong history about you, they've been given the wrong information about you. People interact with other people based on their uh, history of the other person, you see. If people want to change the nature of people's relationships, they will often falsify the history of one or both of those persons, knowing that one or both of those persons are going to interact with each other differently depending on their history or that sense of the history of the individual. This goes on with groups, ladies and gentlemen. That's why those in power then, you see, rewrite history. Because in rewriting history, they rewrite the person's perception of himself whose history they've rewritten. They also then change that person's behavior and relationships with other people, given the, the history that they've come to believe. And they also change the way other people interact with those people, you see, b uh, based on the history that they've learned about the people, you see. That's why any group has to take command of its history and to make sure that it uh, projects the kind of history that operates in its best interest. It cannot let another people write its history and uh, let another people, you see, determine the nature of its history. And it must also know the history of other people as well if it is to, to maintain self-control and self-determination, you see. But history is not a mere remembrance of uh, experience. Everything we've learned, we've learned in the past. You know, if you've learned to talk, you've learned to walk, and any other thing you've learned it when? Not today, you learned it years ago. So if you, in a, in a purely theoretical sense, forgot all of your history and all of your experience, you would return then to a fetal state of existence to a, a state of immaturity. You would be reduced in your capacity to deal with current and present realities. Many of the coping techniques and things that you've learned in your past would not be useful and, uh, to you because you would not have them at hand. The same thing is true then in the life of a people. We learned a lot of things as African people. We learned to cope with a lot of things. We learned a lot of methods and techniques for solving problems. The forgetting of African history, the not knowing of African history then, breeds in us a certain levels of immaturity and incapacities to deal with problems which confront us today. So you see, history is not a game of just remembrance. History is, 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 is an instrument of power and when you let another people, as I said earlier, uh, falsify your history, they then will destroy your power and your potential as a people and your capacity to solve your problems as a people. So we're going to be talking about this. We're going to talk about how uh, European history's mythology organized our mentality today as African people and how we have to see European history as a mythology and uh, get a more correct and realistic knowledge of European history as a way of getting a more correct and realistic knowledge of ourselves and as a way of getting in control of ourselves. We are also going to talk about in that book uh, a psychology why are we labeled as maladjusted and so forth? And why do we let another people place labels on us? Why do we let another people call our children learning disabled? Why have not we examined those definitions? 
to a very great extent, the destruction of our children is taking place because we have accepted without opposition or critical analysis the definition of other people of their behavior. A people who have falsified our history do not know the psychology of our children nor us, but yet who are arrogant enough to feel that they can label our behavior and then impose programs on them. You must understand, you see, the labeling of behavior is not a mere designation of certain forms of behavior, but is a form of domination. So when you're permitted to label other people, you also are authorizing certain types of behavior toward those people. You're authorizing the withdrawal of certain rights. You're authorizing restraints and constraints on their behavior. You're authorizing, you see, the uh, taking away of privileges and authorizing the imposition of all kinds of uh, punitive and, and other so-called measures. So labeling children and labeling people's behavior is not something that should be taken easily, uh, uh, something that should be looked upon as purely the work of experts. No, no, you, you, as a people then, we must regain the capacity to label our own behavior and to deal with that behavior within our own context, you see. We have this great genius in our children and yet we have people in authority labeling them as learning disabled. It doesn't work and it shouldn't work. That leads me then to the other publication we have coming out here soon. I was talking earlier here to Brother Gus, for instance, just speaking of psychology for a minute, and perhaps we'll elaborate it on it in our second session, when we were discussing the issue of um, normality. What is normality? What is identity, you see? And we talk about normal behavior and abnormal behavior without really examining what it was about. And I mentioned to, to Brother Gus that uh, normality as a concept is more or just as much a political or uh, economic concept as it is a psychological concept. Yet most people think of it as a psychological concept, you see. Who defines what is normal and in what way does behaving normally according to their definition operate in their interest? You see, so again, talking about normal and abnormal behavior, uh, you're not just talking about designating behavior. Again, behind the labeling of behavior as normal or abnormal is a whole political and economic program. And therefore, behind the whole facade of psychology as a helping profession is really the whole nature of domination and control. In other words, our domination is hidden behind the helping professions, you see, special education, stuff like that. When you look behind it, you'll see political social programs. That's why they don't do any good much when you look at them. And so we are examining this and we're demonstrating how this works. What do you mean apathet apathetic, that black people are apathetic? You know, and when you call apathy a, a uh, psychological problem, you begin to recognize though as I've said before, in order for this system to operate, black people have to be crazy. <laughs> oh yeah. We could not be in our right minds and be in the condition we're in. That's a political necessity, an economic necessity. We talk about apathy, for instance, where people have supposedly do not show an interest in, a passion for, those things and, 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 
activity and knowledge, which if they did so, would change their circumstances. We're left puzzled, you see. Why doesn't this person show an interest in reading and writing and understanding? Because if they did, they could achieve certain things and solve certain problems. And we call that apathy, and we see that as a disturbed mental state, particularly when the opportunity is there for them to do so. But then you begin to recognize that apathy in our people is a necessary state in order for this system to, to operate. That we are not apathetic all over. We are apathetic in certain key areas of life. We'll work all day and night throwing balls and catching balls. No problem there. But we won't work all night at the math, at the reading and the science. You see, so even the apathy is organized. But when you look at it closely, you recognize that it is politically organized. That we are most apathetic and lazy in those areas which if we were not, we would challenge those in power. You see? If we were not apathetic in technology, economic development, science, political organization and so forth, then this system couldn't be the same that it is today. In fact, we would threaten and perhaps overthrow those who rule over us, you see. So in those very areas, we must feel very lethargic. It's very hard for us to uh, get the energy to move in those areas. And so we're dealing with that. How do you get a people, you see, set up in a state of mind so that, in a sense, they will not move in the very areas that they need to move to get themselves out of their predicament. So you can see then a black psychology and a psychology from an African-centered point of view uh, approaches the issues very differently. And we must look at these things in a very different fashion than before. And that's what we'll be doing in uh, the falsification and mislabeling of black consciousness and behavior. And we hope then you will uh, support us in this because this is not a personal wealth creating project. I make absolutely not one nickel from the selling of books. Uh, I get no personal income, nor my partners from, from our books. The books are there principally for information and for developing a, a means of communicating very important information to our community and for developing other economic po uh, projects that are important to our community. So in a sense then, in supporting the literature, you are really supporting commu a community project, not, not, my, not my personal wealth, of which I have none. <laughs> okay. uh, the last book I'll mention is, well, there are two authors. One I want to mention, of course, that will be coming out soon is called, is, has a working title, a blueprint for black power. And I'm working on the very last chapter of it now. Uh, it was originally a set of 10 lectures that I planned to do in the fall on power. Ultimately, even when we talk uh, about so-called black on black violence, or when we talk about the miseducation of our children, or many of the other problems that we talk so much about. You must come to recognize that to a very great extent, these problems flow from our powerlessness as people. They flow from the fact that we have not developed the power to change our circumstances. And that we will not change our circumstances until we develop real power. There's no other way around it. Trying to get other people to have goodwill and love between sisters and brothers ain't gonna work, I'm telling you. It's not gonna do it. You gotta have power to even get them to, to believe that. Powerful people don't pay much attention to the sermons of the powerless. No. 
preaching and ranting and raving at those other folk <laughs> is not going to have much influence on their behavior. Why should they pay you any attention? You don't represent anything. <laughs> okay, so you got to have power to even convince them to love you. <laughs> <laughs> to be brotherly and to be sisterly. Why should I be sisterly to you? What does it mean? You can't do anything to me. That's what they say. You can't do anything for me. So what's the point? Why should I love you? What I have to gain by loving you? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, a lot of us, you know, think that we can just preach the enemy into submission. It ain't going to happen. But if you got some power behind what you're saying, things happen, you see. People listen to powerful people, don't they? If we want to be heard, if black people have a different message, if African people have a different message, a different philosophy and ideology, then African people must back that ideology up with power. But as long as you don't have any power, your message can be as beautiful and as wonderful as you want it to be. Nobody's going to hear you. No, that's going to pay you any mind. See, a lot of people here were quite perturbed about the, the gay initiative in terms of the U.S. Army. And you got a lot of discussion about whether they should be in the Army or outside of the Army and all of this other kind of stuff. But I think what was missing in that discussion was not the morality or the immorality of the deal, was how did this group of people get their agenda to be almost number one on the uh, president's uh, list? You know, regardless of what you may think about them as persons or the movement, that becomes the issue. Why is it that black people who outnumber gays and all of this other stuff cannot get a black agenda? in the presidential situation. You see, that to me was the issue. How can this minority of people, and for some people, how can this stigmatized group of people move a president to push against the grain that way? To me, that's worth an analysis there, <laughs> you see. And here is a group of people who, didn't, who are not running away from their identity despite the fact that that identity may be ridiculed, and despite the fact that they may be attacked for being identified as what they are, and so forth. But I find it interesting that instead of trying to hide it by saying, I am a human being, I am an American, uh, you know, all these labels we use to try to hide who and what we are, what do they say? We're here, we are queer, and we're in your face. <laughs> you know? Now do something about it. You see? And as a result of that, what happens? Things what? Move. You see? And it shows and it demonstrates something. You don't gain by running and hiding and denying who and what you are, no matter whether people like you or not. You stand up for who you are and you speak loud about who you are. I'm black and I'm proud. This is what it's about. I'm an African person. This is who I am. I don't give a hoot whether you like it or not. You're going to have to deal with it. This is how you get agendas on programs and you move things forward. Not by hiding and sneaking and abstracting yourself. You see? But being real and putting power behind your reality. The gays, I think, are having a parade here today, aren't they, in D.C.? Where they promised to have a million strong up there. Well, what is that about? Demonstrating what? Strength. That's what a demonstration does. It says, hey, it's just not one person speaking, two people speaking. When we speak, there are what? Millions behind us. That's why you make marches. That's why you have demonstrations. This is like when you when you show the enemy your army. It's okay, you know, here we are. We have what? Strength of numbers and commitment behind what we say. And people what? Listen, you see. And this is the thing that African people have to do. 
We stand up as Africans and we demonstrate as Africans and we demonstrate power. And so we're going to be talking in detail about how we build power in this world and demonstrate our power and use our power as African people in our own interest. We must study power. Many of us are afraid to talk about it, you see. We've been made, uh, too many of us in our churches, to see the pursuit of power as something sinful and terrible. But it takes power to be alive. If you have no power, you're dead, just like a battery. <laughs> power is, is the essence of life. There is no life without power, you see. And therefore, if you want to stay alive, maintain your life, enhance your life and your survival, then you must develop power and, and, and maintain the power to do so. Otherwise, it won't happen. You can't do it without power. And somehow someone is trying to convince us that, that this is the case. We're afraid to talk about power. We're afraid to talk about wealth, you see? And because of that, we are poverty-stricken in too many ways. And when in the later session, we'll come back to this. But we're going to talk about power. The final book that we've done, and probably coming out in the fall, Educating Black Children for the 21st Century. What is an African-centered education? What is that about? It's about far more than black history and, and, and African culture. There's much, much more. In fact, the African-centered point of view covers every aspect of life. When you educate people in terms of Afri African-centeredness and you socialize children in terms of African-centeredness, you apply this perspective to every aspect of life, not just to history, not just to culture, but you, you apply it to economics, human and personal relations, institutional building, and the whole bit. It fits in every area of life. And so when we talk about an African-centered education, we're not talking about an African-centered education that only deals with the raising of self-esteem or getting people only to know their history. This is an education for power. This is an education for economic development. This is an education for nation building. This is education for liberation, you see. This is an education for love, cooperation, all of these other things. And therefore, if we are going to truly educate our children, we must then bring into being an African-centered education that educates the whole of their personalities and selves, not just aspects and parts of them. And so we're going to go into, into that. In the meanwhile, I want to urge you to read Brother Koto's book on nation building. You may not be familiar with it. I hope it's on sale out there. Is it on sale out there, Brother Gus? Okay, look it up. Very, very important book. I recommend it highly. A great idea of what an African-centered curriculum really involves is contained in that book. I'm including a copy of his curriculum in my own work because it fits uh, very much what we talk about when we talk about an African-centered education and what it's about. And because, in the end, you cannot truly talk about African-centered education unless you're talking about nation building. And unless you're talking about building a pan-African global economic system and social and political system, you see. You don't start talking about the appropriate education of children by, uh, based on negatives. You know, what they are not learning in school why they are not reading, why they are not learning math. As I've said before, education is not for children, actually. Education is for the nation. And you start with the issue of what problems must the nation or must the people solve. That's where you start. What problems are we confronted with as people? What economic problems are we confronted with? What political problems are we confronted with? We're confronted with the problem of oppression. We're dealing with the other problem here today, 
black on black violence. These are problems that we must solve as people. Then we start asking ourselves the question, what kind of people must we become in order to solve the problems that confront us? You see, this is where curriculum development begins, not with what the kids are not getting, you see. Then you follow that up with saying then, what kind of institutions and social relations and attitudes must we develop among ourselves so that we can be the kind of people we need to be to solve the kind of problems we must solve as people. And then you follow that up by asking the question, what kind of educational and socialization experiences must we undergo as adults and as children so that we can become the kind of people we need to be and develop the kind of relationships we need to have and the kind of institutions that we need to have to solve the kinds of problems we have, you see. And you can see then your curriculum develops out of that, you see. Then you look at the developmental psychology of your children and you see at what point they are most ready to gain from particular educational and socialization experiences. When are they most ready to be taught reading and so forth, you see? And then you match then their education and socializational experiences with their level of readiness, with their developmental psychology. So you can optimize their learning and their ability to internalize what they need to internalize in order to become the people we need for them to become to solve the problems of the nation, you see? This is where you go in terms of developing a curriculum, not the other way around, where you say, well, they're not learning this, they're not learning that, and the next thing you know, you're trying to put in a program here and a program there and a program here, and just got a patchwork of programs that really in the end does not resolve the issue. And even if the programs are successful, you'll find that you will educate children and educate people who can solve the problems of other people but not solve their own problems because they are being educated to resolve the problems of other people and not their own problems. They're being educated to get a job, jobs owned by whom? Others, not themselves, instead of being educated to do what? Create jobs, make jobs, develop employment opportunities. That's what an African-centered education does. It just doesn't educate people to, uh, to higher levels of servitude to others. No, no. African-centered education makes opportunity for African people. It creates jobs for African people. It creates economic institutions for African people. It builds houses for African people. It doesn't teach people how to beg for them. It teaches people how to build. This is an African-centered education, you see, appropriately developed. If our problem is unemployment, then an African-centered education educates its people how to create employment for themselves. That's what an African-centered education does, you see. So see, it's not just about reading and writing and self-esteem. It's a part of the whole survival mechanism of a people. And this is what we'll be talking about in educating African children for the 21st century. And this is the kind of program we're trying to develop. These are not intellectual uh, play games. These, these are real prescriptive approaches to problems and issues. And I've taken this time, which I should not have, but to sort of have uh, introduced you to the kind of things that we are trying to do and uh, to, to hope that uh, you'll continue to support us and that you yourself will contribute to this movement. We need a lot of writing done. This is an information age. And we need a lot of information, African people. 
and we need a lot of written information. While I can understand our celebration of the African oral tradition, and that has its place, but after all, we must face the reality that we are operating in an electronic communications age. And while there is a place for our oral tradition, we cannot become solely dependent on oral, uh, the oral passing of information. We must become the generators of information and use every type of information dissemination available to us. That includes then not only oral uh, dissemination, but it includes, of course, the, the literate dissemination of information, the electronic dissemination of information. To a great extent, <clears throat> those races that will survive throughout the next century or past the next century will be those races who have an edge on information and on its use, who can generate it, who have control over it, and who can use it to their advantage. And we need a lot of information. There's not enough information out here flowing to our people. Let's get to the subject matter at hand. Black on black violence. I don't have to reiterate to you, of course, the problems. You're dealing with them. I saw this morning in the Dallas Morning News, you're still doing an analysis of the fracas that went on around the, the celebration there of the Dallas Cowboys, I believe. And of course, certainly Waco is fresh on your mind. And the fact is that in the last few years, you've had quite a rise in, in violence in the community, both in this city, Houston, and in other places. And violence uh, is occurring all across this country. A recent study by the National Crime Analysis Project at Northeastern University indicated here as published in the uh, New York Times in October, last October, that the number of 17-year-olds arrested for murder climbed 121% from 85 to 1991. And we know it was very high in 1985. The number of 16-year-olds arrested for murder climbed, uh, rose 158 percent. But the highest increase, 217 percent, was in the arrest of 15-year-old youngsters. And even the number of arrests for boys 12 and under has soared 100 percent since 85. So we can see that we are facing an epidemic here, a sort of crime epidemic. One of the experts indicated that what we've seen in the past few years is nothing compared with what we'll see in the next decade and on into the next century as the resurging adolescent population mixes with changes in our society and our culture. The arrest rate for murders did decline from 80 to 85 as the percentage of young people fell. But since 85, there has been a 24% increase in the, in the homicide rate and a 36% increase in overall violent crimes, largely because of the unexpected upsurge of violence among young boys. And we see here then these youngsters are, are killing each other mainly due to the drug epidemic among, they mentioned here, the urban poor, the growing number of firepower, number of firepower of guns, the eroding quality of public schools, and the glorification of violence on television and in the movies. This, of course, we are familiar with, so I will not uh, reiterate it too much. But people are not shooting people, and our youngsters are not shooting youngsters. And a generation of young men, before they can even become men, before they can 
can uh, develop careers before they can support families and so forth are dead. We, uh, this kind of violence is not merely random violence. It's not violence that just flows up from some kind of criminal personality within our youth. This violence occurs within various contexts. Violence, like any other psychological behavioral class, is the outcome of, of the interaction between particular states of consciousness of persons. People who engage in violence are people who are operating in a particular state of mind. They have a certain type of consciousness. They have certain types of attitudes, perspectives, and values and feelings that they exhibit toward themselves as persons that they exhibit toward each other and toward the world. And so if we are to come to understand the so-called prevalence of black on black violence in our community, we must also come to understand then the consciousness that is prevalent within our community and that is prevalent among our youngsters. The attitudes, the values, the perspectives that they have, the way they look at each other and look at the world. These states of mind, of consciousness, these perspectives themselves reflect historical, cultural, economic, political, and physical environmental circumstances. To a very great extent, we are deceived by those who write about crime merely as a psychological state, and a psychological state that is unconnected to what else goes on in the world. There is no psychological state unconnected to the rest of the world. What's the point of talking about it, except in terms of its connectedness with what is going on? Psychological states themselves then reflect political economic circumstances. This is the reason why I mentioned earlier, if we are to come to understand our psychology, but as well as to understand our behavior, we have to understand our history and culture. We have to also understand economic circumstances. But you see, for a group of people who want to condemn us and make us criminal by nature, these other things are left out so that they can now talk about us as, you, as is the current style in terms of our genetic background as if violence is implanted in our genes. So even while we had a black secretary of health, we had a government up there trying to talk about the fact that it was going to study the relationship between genetics and violence. A pathetic situation, by the way, isn't it? I was at one of these conferences at Columbia University. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, the question I asked, filled with white folk and white experts, you know, if you're going to study the relationship between violence and genes, then why are you studying black folk? <laughs> and isn't it interesting, as I will point out here later on, in the face of the tremendous record of violence of Europeans, that we see black folk and black youngsters and black young men as the subject matter for studying a relationship between genes and, and violence. What a joke. But we get these kind of jokes all the time. Yeah, all the time. It's an amazing feat that uh, the most violent people in the world and the most criminal people in the world are taken as models of sanity. And their victims are seen, you know, as models of criminality. It's, 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 but that has, that's the way it has to be under an oppressive system. As I will talk a little bit later, everything has to be done what? Turned what? Backwards. Everything's turned backwards, you see? Oh, they were studying gangs. And again, I ask them, if you're studying gangs, why are you studying black youngsters? You know? Do you know that the army 
is one of the biggest gains in the world? Yes. For the armies, big gangs. Yes. Big gangs, mostly of men, who go and rob other people and nations of their wealth, who terrorize other groups and nations. You see? But again, you see, we are deceived by words. Of course, that's why they don't want to teach your children to read, you understand? <laughs> and I want to teach you to really understand words in depth, you see? Because then you sweep this, what are you talking about, Armin? This is nothing but a gang. What do, what do you mean here? This is nothing but a gang. What do you mean government? This is a mafia operation. <laughs> oh yeah, you, you think because the government has a constitution and a bunch of laws, it's legitimate. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a legitimate government. This is a gang of people here who came over and did what? Took other people's lands, took their lives, and then they made a constitution and deceived us into thinking they were legit. Are you kidding? <laughs> See again, you think it's turned around, right? You talk about the glorious history of the Vikings. What are these marauders, gangs, running around? They, 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 they thought planting and, and farming was a feminine activity. So what do they do? They let other people plant and farm, and then they go around knocking people in the head and taking their stuff. We can go on with this. We don't have time to do it. I just want to, you know, sort of break your mind open a little bit and just sort of alert you to not following words and labels so easily, you see. You know, so you, 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 you call it an army and immediately you forget that this is a gang, you see. Or you call it national interest and don't forget that, and forget that this is a mafia operation that says Central and South America is our territory and we don't want anybody else messing with it. Of course, you call that the Monroe Doctrine. <laughs> it's a mafia doctrine. <laughs> That's all it is. And the Central and the South Americans have what? Not a thing to say about it. And the instance they say, well, we want to elect our own government. We want to, have, hey, wait a minute, hold on. If it's not in line with what we want, uh-uh, we're going to do you in. How different is that from a drug gang that moves into a community? and tells the community, this is our territory. They don't own a house or a stick in it, but it's their territory. And when people say, well, we want to walk the street peacefully, we want this and that, no, no, no. You can't do that. This is, this is for, for us, you see. But again, you see, when you're not alive to yourself, you don't have an African-centered perspective and, a, and an African consciousness and so forth, then you, you will study your victimology as if it is a cause and not a result, and therefore be further victimized, which is why the problems never get solved, you see, and why the education never seems to work, okay? So we have to understand this. So the understanding of violence in the African community requires that we come to some understanding of its causal circumstances and rearrange or eliminate them in ways which reduce or eliminate violence. This is what is required here. We want to look at violence then in, in three contexts, in the cultural context of violence in America as a whole, the cultural context of violence in black America and in the ecological context of violence in black America. And I'll move rapidly through this and we'll go into the details uh, uh, in, in the next session. America began as an act of violence. America as a nation is rooted in violence which is one of the reasons why it is one of the most violent nations on earth whether you're talking about black or white you see as i said earlier don't let that constitution fool you and all of this democracy stuff talk and uh, deceive you 
What are its origins? The origins of America are criminal. And it therefore is what I call a crimogenic society in that it breeds criminality because it is rooted in criminality. Why are you surprised? What are the two major acts of criminality that brought this country into being? The first one, of course, was what? The criminal destruction of Indian nations. Rape and robbery and thievery. Taking of lands and taking of wealth. Destroying of people's cultures and nations. Placing people in prisons called reservations. Slandering their culture and their character as people. This country is built on it. I don't give a hoot whether you love it or not. It's what it's built on and that's the reality of it. And why can I call it a crime? Because I can call it a crime based on the white folks themselves. They came over here with the Bible in their hand, didn't they? They came over here uh, touting something called the golden rule, didn't they? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Okay, so don't tell me they didn't know any better. They would not have had that done to themselves. And yet they did it to others. And so within the context of their own cultural definitions and within the context of their own religion, they were criminals. Okay, and we have to face that. Of course, the next major crime was the enslavement of African people, was the destruction of African civilizations. You talk about the disruption of the black family, as if that disruption occurred since the 1960s and 70s. The disruption of the African family began with slavery. That's where it started. And the disruption of African culture, the disruption of social relations and arrangements and institutions of African people began with slavery and it has not stopped yet. And yet millions of our people died in this process and were killed in this process. And we have an endless history of death, damnation, and destruction. The coercion of our people into work a slandering of our culture and a slandering of our character, the lynching of our people, the physical abuse of our people, the racial discrimination against our people, all of these things with which we are familiar have been practiced from day one in this country. And these practices are criminal. And therefore America is rooted in this criminality. But see, America won't face this reality. And many of us won't face it. And we won't come to terms with it. And yet, we go to these churches, and we talk every day about the fact that people are not saved unless they what? Repent of their sins. Yes. Repent. The old rich man ran to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? Give your money back to the poor, you thief. <laughs> he didn't do it, though, did he? <laughs> but that was the thing. Look, you got to give it up. You got to give it back. You got to repent. You got to admit. But you see, we as black people want to uh, 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 put that rule on ourselves, but we don't demand it on those who misused us. And if they do not reparate, and if they do not repent, if they do not come to terms with the sins enumerated by their own book, the book that they laid on us, then they will suffer, and as they suffer, we will suffer. I'm telling you. But we don't want to deal with that. See, we want somehow God to overlook white folk. <laughs> you see? It ain't gonna happen. We think somewhere down the road these writers are going to really share something with us. 
I tell people this. That thing is very interesting. The rich man runs says, what should I do to be saved? And he says, uh, give the money back to the poor, you know. <laughs> Joker ran out. <laughs> and I said, look, if you think that Jesus is God, isn't it interesting that this man looks God right in the face and says it ain't happening? <laughs> okay? And Jesus says he got as much of a chance of getting into heaven as a camel through the eye of a needle, right? I say that for you people who sit around here thinking one day good news is going to strike this white man's heart. And he's going to share equally his wealth and power with you just out of the goodwill and goodness of his mind. If he can look your God, if the rich man can look God in the face and say no, you know doggone well, then these folk can look you in the face and gonna say no. So you got to figure another way of dealing with it, another way of approaching it. You, 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 don't, you may as well give up waiting for that great day when somewhere this white is going to find it is hard to share what he has with you. That's why you got to study power. You got to take it. Yeah. And this violence perpetrated by whites it was not, again, just violence, random violence. Always when you have violence, you have a mythology that rationalizes and justifies what you're doing, you see. And it's interesting to look at mythologies. The mythology of conflict resolution that they have. And that, that, that mythology is a part of America even today. How do you resolve com uh, conflict? Take it out and shoot them. Where did we get that from? Frontier justice. <laughs> You're right in the middle of it. <laughs> the old Western mythologies. You know, people have never really stopped to study how much violence really went on in the West. You'd be surprised. Not nearly as much as you think. Nah, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at how much lying has gone on about the cowboy and the, you know, and all that stuff. In fact, it's interesting if you read some of the current, some of you may be familiar with the current struggle going on over Sam Houston, right? Since you're here in Texas, huh? You know, somebody wants to build a statue for him somewhere out there. Then there's another group that says, no, not for that old drunkard. He was a drunkard, you know. <laughs> And it's, yeah, a drunken sod came right into Texas here trying to be big man. Sorry to dump on your land here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ne'er do well looking for a new opportunity in the land of Texas. A bad general too. Running like hell from, from Santa Ana and the other people there. No. Oh yeah, check check the real history out. You see? Now you got your what is this, your fourth largest city in the country or whatever? Named after Sam Houston, but you haven't really studied who Sam Houston was. What a rascal he was. How he was not really thought that well of by many people. How the battle he won was more by accident than it was by design and plan. <laughs> the whole bit. All kinds of myths have been generated to what? To justify this nation. So the myth of the chosen, that these people were chosen by God in some way to rule the earth. The myth of what it means to be a man, you see. All of these kinds of myths have become a part of American folklore, but they're just not folklore. They become a part of people's ways of behaving and relating to other people. A real man don't take no stuff. You know, and he or she dissed me, you know. And how do you resolve that? You know, you go for it. <laughs> because that's what? The American way of solving problems, you see. 
and there's a mythology there. People not only dominate other people, they rationalize that domination. They make an excuse for dominating other people. So the whites had to rationalize the, their immoral behavior that was even condemned by their own Bible and by their own God. They had to rationalize the murder of Indians and the enslavement of black folk. And in order to rationalize it then, they had to create a racial mythology that we were born to be slaves. <laughs> you see? So they're not doing anything wrong. This is right in line with God's plan. They brushed off that old dusty myth of Ham to try to convince themselves and us that somehow in the divine order of things, we were designed to, to be the servants of others. And yet even the reading of that thing itself does not say that at all. But people believe it because it's a part of the racial mythology that has been laid down, you see. And so many of us are willing to forgive those other people for what they've done and ask nothing from them because in a sense we've subconsciously internalized these kind of mythologies, you see, that somehow we are people who are supposed to be the servants of other people. And if that's one of the reasons why we think that they're going to be exempted from the law. The Indians were destroyed because they were what? Savages. <laughs> okay? They're the savages. They're the ones without civilization. They fed you when you got in would have starved to death, maintained the white colonies and so forth. And what thanks did they get for it? Death. Why? Because they were savages. So again, what do you got? Oppression. Things are being done done what? Turn around. Turn backwards. You see, the victim is made to appear to be the perpetrator. You see? And this is what mythology does. Mythology seeks to what we call naturalized history. To make what is appear to be what is natural or what has been divinely ordained by some natural order or by some divine order. And so we get a mythology. Not only though do people uh, build a mythology to justify what they're into, they act in terms of the mythologies that they develop. <clears throat> the mythology of racism and the mythology that was built around black people is used to justify segregation, justify discrimination, justify all forms of misbehavior toward us as a people. Once you use that mythology and use the mythology to create an environment, you actually then begin to create behavior as a result of placing the person in a particular environment, you see. And this is what happens. You put people in a particular environment, after a while, that environment is reflected in their behavior. You put a person in prison, you keep them in prison, they learn to be criminal. Yes, and we know prisons are schools for criminality. But you see, the process of putting them in is overlooked. The process of creating the environment is overlooked. What you do is count noses after you've done it. He said, oh, well, you know, so many of them are arrested for violence. That means they must be violent. But the whole process of how it happened is not dealt with. I deal with something in black on black violence I call the structuration of crime. What am I trying to say there? Simply because a man mugs someone else doesn't mean he's more criminal than a man who swindles, even though we are, con we are often convinced of that. Often crime is not irrational, but a rational process. People weigh, you know, they weigh all kinds of options often when they engage in crime. When you've robbed a person of education, 
You've robbed them of job opportunities and possibilities, locked them in, in what amounts to reservations. If they had the same level of criminality as a person who has a degree in accounting, works as a vice president of a bank, they're going to create two different sorts of crimes, not because they, one is more criminal than the other, but because of the structure in which they both reside. As I've said before, it's crazy if you are an accountant and you have control of the money and you can electronically transfer millions of dollars to your own account for you to go out in the street and knock somebody in the head for a few nickels. <laughs> you have what? Different options. <laughs> Not that you're necessarily less criminal. Your object is the same, to do what? Get money. You look at your options. So, hey, man, I can transfer this. Doop, 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 doop. I got a million, I'm done with it. <laughs> but another man who's not what? Sitting at that position, is not in that place, looks at his options. Well, I either got to break into a house, knock somebody in the head, you know, one way or the other, you see. And yet we don't talk about, you see, how so-called black-on-black -black violence and, and the criminality in our community is structured by the very system itself. You see, how placing and restricting our people under certain circumstances and restricting their options, we literally dictate the types of crime that they will commit when they commit them. And then we want to talk about their violent nature and try to connect it with their genes. <laughs> See, when these whites were begging and, and, and poor and weak over here in this country, they didn't hesitate to kill and mug the Indians, did they? To rape and rob and steal and do whatever they could. Once they got it under control and passed their mafia rules, they didn't have to engage in that anymore. They used their armed police force and other kind of things to do that. And then they can look like they are less violent and less, you know, this and that. Why? Because they're less criminal? No. Because their options are different. You see? And in the way then if we to change the nature of so-called criminal evidence, I tell people, look, you want us to get out of violent crime? Let us become accountants. <laughs> No. <laughs> then we'll just we'll just run a good SNL scandal on you. But we won't hit anybody in the head, you know. Or shoot anybody. But it's very important for us to understand as we gotta rush through here. Uh, but we gotta look at these kind of things, you see, before we just jump up and make moral condemnations and, and, and make psychological condemnations of people and other kind of things. You, that's why, you see, you gotta be African-centered in your education so that you can perform the right kind of analyses and things. But when you let other people teach your children, you let other people teach you, they're gonna teach you and educate you into ignorance and into stupidity, I'm telling you and into blindness and distort your perception and capacity to see what is going on. And you'll join with them in condemning yourself and your children, you see. And you will think that the only thing that needs to be changed is some kind of moral relationship here, uh, an outcome. No, there, there are political and social and economic changes that must occur if we are to change things here. So to a great extent, the crime that's created in this world is created as a result particularly in terms of the so-called black community, of uh, the structuring of this society by white domination and the mythology that it projects to justify that domination. Most of all, it's structured by the white's denial of their own criminality and their own criminal behavior and, by, and their projecting of their own criminality onto their victims. So the Indians become the savages even though they were minding their business before you got here. They were alive, they had their nations. But now you say that they were killed because they were savages. You see, so the whole thing gets turned around. Tremendous psychic violence, which I think is even worse than physical violence, 
was visited on our people. We don't have talk, time to talk about this today. Why do we think of black people anyway as more criminal? Let's look quickly at this game and see how it's played, this projecting of criminality. The political paradox is, as stated in the Wall Street Journal in August 1992, people with the least to fear from crime drive the crime issue. Appeals to suburban whites highlight split between perception and reality. In other words, people who are least threatened by crime are the first one to talk about it. <laughs> and the people who are less threatened directly by crime are the first people that the politicians talk to and generate fear. And about crime. You had Clinton talking about the hiring 100,000 police officers. And yet, the perception of crime and the, and the public's perception of crime and the reality of crime uh, remain far apart. In 1990, whites committed 54% of all violent crimes while blacks committed 45%. The rate of increase in the incidence of violent crime over the past decade has been the same among blacks and whites. But why do we get this image of black folk as being the criminal folk, you see? Moreover, violent crimes between races are by far the exception. Black people are not out here wholesalely attacking white folk. Black folk are victimized more by other black folk than by anyone else, and so are white folk. In 1998, full 92% of violent crimes committed against whites were committed by other whites, while 84% of violent crimes committed against blacks were committed by other blacks. So why do we get this image here of some black folks stalking in the shadows, uh, uh, looking to victimize white folk more than they victimize themselves? Why is crime even talked about with that image anyway, you see? You must recognize then that there's a political game going on here, a psychological game, a mythology being created, a managing of image to justify domination, a managing of image to justify unemployment and to justify locking people in inner city reservations and to justify the continued control of the lives of African people by non-African people. Going against the very facts that these people themselves collect, you see, and know better. And while the, and, and if we look at a couple of other things here, the American Medical Association published ran in June 1992 a battery of some 70 studies indicating that the greatest increase in gunshot deaths has been among white men and women in large and small cities with black men and for black men in small cities. Among white men and women in inner city, the, uh, that is violence among white men and women in the inner cities rose by about 30%, slightly more than blacks. So where do we get this image here then, that blacks are in the vanguard of criminality in this country? And why do we, as black people, buy this? Doesn't mean that we are not engaged in violence, the police, I'm not saying that. But why is it that we have this one side uh, image? TV is promoting this perception. Why do we have the image of the white woman is being victimized by the hulking black man. When a recent study indicates, it found that women of any age were far less likely to be uh, victimized and the victims of crime than men. In fact, black males are by far the most frequent victims of violence. For every 1,000 black males over the age of 12, 53 have been victims of a violent crime. That compares with 35 white males 28.2 black females and 21.3 white females, but yet we get this image of Miss Helpless, you know, being uh, brutalized and overrun by black men. We have to face what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen. We have a game being played 
on the minds of our people. A game that is used to justify uh, violence. I wish I had time, we don't have time to talk about the increasing violence in white suburban schools that's occurring and the increasing violence occurring in white rural schools of uh, places like Dartmouth, Massachusetts, where uh, white boys walked into the classroom with a bad knife and everything, walked directly into the class while the teacher's teaching to stab another student to death. And they say, oh, we thought this only happened in the inner city. <laughs> well, it's happening all over because America is a violent society on the whole, you see. And this violence is around, but we don't hear much about that. When we talk about violence, as I said earlier, why do we look at ourselves only? A few instances of how whites rationalize their control and how they project their criminality on other people, I think, can be illustrated by the following set of facts. That white males are arrested more. Whites are arrested more for violent crimes, including murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault than blacks. More arrested for property crime, including burglary, larceny, motor vehicle, theft, and arson. More arrested for drug abuse violation, weapons carrying, possessions, forgery, and counterfeiting. Offenses against family and children. Most sex offenses driving under the influence, disorderly conduct, liquor laws, and runaways. How do we get this image then of the black criminal man as being what it is today? I cannot fail to mention the crimes of the white male against black humanity in the forms of wars of conquest, colonization, and ongoing oppression, of wars using African puppet proxy armies and white and black terrorists and mercenaries, repressive neo-colonial governments against African populations. These war crimes perpetrated by the white male have produced murdered casualties and maimings in the millions. If you read a current book by Brzezinski, who I think was what, Secretary of State or something under uh, Nixon or so forth. He has a book now, let's see, in fact, there are two out now. One, Pandemonium, I believe, I may have it mixed up, that's written by um, Monaghan, and I forget the name of the one that is written by Brzezinski. These people are coming face to face with the fact that we are not facing a new world order, we are facing a new world disorder. And they're coming face to face with the fact that ethnicity is not going away. It never went away, and it ain't going nowhere. And that a serious mistake is overlooked, when, is, is made when you do not deal with ethnicity and with uh, 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 religious philosophy and so forth. When you look around the world, this is what you see. This is what's happening in the world. And now they're trying to deal with it. Brzezinski, I think, makes the statement that in the 20th century, essentially, these Europeans have perpetrated the death of 167 million people. And I said earlier then, why are we looking at the African American gang member trying to study him in terms of uh, genetics and crime? Despite all of this, the media has successfully created and maintained an image of Africans, particularly African-American males, has its greatest menace to life and limb. I have to sum it up here, but this is the kind of cultural context in which black on white violence takes. And we have to look at it within that context. This violence has created a lot of the violence that we see today, alienation, and created the, the emotions, alienations, anger, hypersensitivity, inferiority com uh, complex, which becomes a source of much misbehavior, including violent behavior. 
this constant propaganda about our people being a criminal people, about the black male being a criminal person, about black people being inferior and so forth, has been internalized by too many of us. And once we internalize that racism, we act toward each other as a white racist would act toward each other. I've indicated to a great extent the black on black criminal is essentially a white racist in black clothing. Because what? He feels and has the same attitude toward his fellow black that a white racist has. We don't have time today to talk about the role of identity and what identity means and what consciousness means, you see. But then you can hear, if you ride the subways in New York City, you can hear our young men using the same words that we here in the South would not, never have used in public. And we would never have allowed ourselves to use in public, you see. But people who now have identified and have, uh, with whites and have inter internalized their attitudes, the same attitudes that whites have internalized toward us, then feel quite free to engage in violence. We have to look at adolescence, the whole issues of adolescence, when people are struggling for power, when young people are struggling with frustration, when they're trying to struggle with their ethnic and sexual identity, when they're trying to gain peer acceptance, when they are concerned with status symbols, boredom, norms, and so forth, and how that feeds into to, uh, uh, the so-called violence that we're talking about as a people. And what have we done to deal with the crisis of adolescence? A quick look then at what I call the ecological context of violence. A recent study was done here in New York demonstrating that 75% of the of those in prison were generated from seven neighborhoods in New York City. In all of the from, from, from all, all over the state, seven neighborhoods generated by 75% of the prisons, prisoners in prison there, indicating that there's something about the ecology of those neighborhoods. There's something happening in those neighborhoods generating a criminality. And of course, you know, I don't have to name the names. Harlem, Bedford Stuyvesant, Brownville, and other names which are very familiar to us. What is going on in those places? You see, violence that begets violence is facilitated when there are no mitigating influences. That is, influences that stand between the person and violence. In other words, if we had a correct e ethnic history, a correct ethnic uh, culture and knowledge of ourselves and ethnic consciousness, if we had appropriate educational institutions, if our family compositions were what they should be, if our employment and incomes were what they should be, then violence would be reduced in our communities. You see, what we call social institutions are not things people just happen to create. Social institutions are instruments created by people to deal with reality, to protect them, to provide for them, to, to, to serve as a power against reality and the power over reality to control reality, you see. We know then that people who generally receive, receive certain levels of education, types of education and so forth, tend to engage in violent behavior less, at least the kind that we're talking about here today. People who have been raised in certain types of family situations tend to produce less violence than others. People who have uh, been uh, socialized in appropriate spiritual institutions tend to be less violent in their orientation than others. People who are, whose household and levels of health and so forth exist tend to, to uh, produce less violence than other people, you see. But you have a trick that has gone on in this country. At the same time, we have been attacked uh, in terms of psych uh, psychic violence by those who rule over us those who've slandered our culture and those who've slandered us as people, these same people have also uh, destroyed the social institutions that we could have used to mitigate 
and reduce the effects of their violence against us as people, you see. So you get a double whammy. It's like when we used to get punished as a kid, somebody get ready to hit you, and you hold up your hand, and they tell you to what? Take your hand down. <laughs> so I can hit you even harder. <laughs> you see? So, you know, so it's not so much sometimes a person is perpetrating violence if you're able to do what? Hold your hand up. Hold something up between yourself and what other people are doing to you. You can provide a defense for yourself. But in this instance, the, we have been attacked, and not only are we attacked, the means by which we can defend ourselves against the attack, against our person and against our character and against our psychological well-being and so forth. The means, the income and the other means that we could use to mitigate and to change the nature and the results of those attacks against us have also been removed. So this then creates violence. So when you look in these communities where education has been disinvested, where deindustrialization has taken over, where whole industries have been have moved out of the communities completely, and now they're getting ready to move these industries totally out of the country, ladies and gentlemen. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the effects of deindustrialization. Even those of us who will be get jobs and degrees don't have much of a future in America. I'm telling you. If we do not wake up and understand what is going on in this country economically, we are going to be destroyed. We got people out here motivating people. You can be what you want to be, live your dream, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that operates on assumptions, ladies and gentlemen. That operates on the assumption of an expanding economy, that there is increasing what? Job opportunities and increasing possibilities. In the 1960s, the United States economy was expanding, and it had opportunities. Then we could say, if we would only move, remove racism and job discrimination, we can make it. But that era is over. This was over 30 years ago. In this era now, the removing of racism is not going to enhance the economic possibilities of black people, because the jobs are not there. The nature of the economy is changing. Racism is no longer our one and only problem. The global economy is changing in such a way that even if whites remove racism right now, tomorrow, we would still be suffering. Because the factories are gone. The factories in Detroit that used to provide good livings for black men and women and families that worked in GM and Ford and so forth, that made it possible for them to raise their children, to build decent housing for their children, to send their children to college and everything, are gone. They've disappeared. And this is the kind of world our youngsters live in. The global nature of this economy is getting ready to even destroy white folk if they're not careful. Let alone what's going to happen uh, to us as people. This 40% of the population growth in the United States is being fueled by immigration. You hear what I'm saying? That means other groups are coming in here piling up on top of black folk by the times and they are better educated. If you compare, for instance, Koreans and others with blacks, you can see an Asian with, with blacks, 46% of the people got college degrees. And we're talking about black people with about 16 to 13%. What are you talking about? These people, and these, they provide 35% of the people coming into America today. The white man is even hiring people against himself, against his own children. You must understand that today, if you look at the exchange rate between the, uh, Rus the Russian ruble and United States dollar, it takes almost 600 Russian rubles to equal one United States dollar. What does that mean? That means that the United States can hire now the top physicists and mathematicians in the world for $100 a month. And that's what's happening. That means that they are bringing the Russians over here now. And you'll see them in the University of Texas at Austin and other places to teach the physics and the mathematics and so forth. At this point, the unemployment rate for new PhDs, and I'm talking about white folk now, new PhDs in mathematics, chemistry, science, computer science is 13%. And I'm talking about people coming out of MIT, Stanford, and the best white universities because they're being undercut by the importation of Russians and other people right in this school. And we could go into details about this thing. This is what we are facing. So I'll finish the rest of it 
when we come back. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Sure, I'm sure that you want to hear the conclusion of this address. Right now we're going to hear some musical numbers by...